Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure once again to welcome Sharon White to the conference. Sharon has agreed to speak to the RTS every year since she joined Ofcom in the spring of 2015. There's always been plenty to say, and it's great to have her back again today. She's probably one of the hardest working public servants on the planet. So following the adage, give a busy woman more work, perhaps she could have been parachuted into the Brexit office. However, we are lucky enough to have her clear thinking here at Ofcom. We heard in the last session some of the arguments and challenges and indeed messages to Sharon White involved in trying to regulate these huge internet companies. Ofcom has also contributed to that debate as we've heard by publishing a discussion document about how aspects of the internet might be regulated. I know Sharon will be able to expand on Ofcom's thinking now. She's going to make a speech after which you and I will have a chance to ask her the questions of our own. Please welcome Sharon White. Great, it's great to be here. Good afternoon. My huge thanks to Kirsty for hosting this session and also to the RTS for organising such a thought-provoking and uh, interesting day. We've already heard some fascinating insights into the question of online regulation. What I want to do now is develop that theme by discussing some of the lessons from Ofcom's experience of regulating broadcasting and how these might be relevant to tackling online harm as the government considers possible legislation. The Guardian sits above us. Uh, many of you will know the motto, comment is free, but facts are sacred. That slogan dates from 1921 and captures the critical importance of accuracy in news. But it also speaks to the internet of today where millions of people can give voice to their views. The flourishing of the internet has been perhaps the greatest ever exercise in the democratization of information. But it does mean that facts can be hard to discern from fiction. So great has the internet's impact been on the media that 15 years ago there was no Facebook, no Twitter, no YouTube. Netflix was still a DVD mail order company. Barely half of us had the internet at home. But on the brighter side, there was no need to carry a selfie stick. Today, the web has encompassed almost every aspect of our lives. An explosion of online services, often free, has changed forever how people communicate and live their lives. That dazzling growth has been fueled by a free and open internet, unencumbered by most of the rules and regulations that apply offline. For many people, that freedom from interference is the very foundation stone of the internet. In 1996, activists declared that cyberspace would be independent from nation states, from regulations, and from the physical world of flesh and steel. Since then, no traditional industry has been able to match the internet's pace of growth and innovation. But we see growing evidence that for all its undoubted benefits, that growth has come at a price. Today, joint research from Ofcom and the Information Commissioner's Office shows that four, four out of every five adult internet users have concerns about going online. Some of those concerns relate to issues like hacking or privacy, but the most common issue raised by two-thirds of people relate to content, particularly content uh, used by children. Some 12 million people using the internet have personally experienced content or conduct that they found harmful. All of us care about this, whether as parents, regulators, program makers, policy makers. France and Germany have already passed legislation, and here too the government prepares its white paper Internet safety is a matter of urgent debate across all the major parties. In July, we've already heard that Damien and the DCMS Select Committee completed its interim report into disinformation and fake news. 
amongst other issues, it looked at the principles that, have, that ought to apply to future regulation. As the communications regulator, we hope to contribute to that debate through our duties set by Parliament to encourage media literacy, our independent research into internet use, and our experience of protecting TV audiences. So today we have published a paper outlining our experience of tackling harmful content in broadcasting while protecting freedom of expression. As policymakers develop their plans, we look at how some of the experience of regulating broadcasting might be relevant to online harm. Content could be harmful because it's illegal, dangerous, misleading, or inappropriate for its audience. And it can be delivered in many forms, from TV-like content, to videos, to images and text. Often, these are served up at the same time on a single screen, and different rules apply depending on the mode of delivery. As the broadcasting regulator, we are very conscious of the growing disparity between the safeguards that everyone in this room is required to meet in making traditional TV programmes and the much more limited rules that apply online. To illustrate the point, take a typical child in the UK. She spends around 90 minutes a day watching broadcast TV, much more than that on her phone and the internet. But the protection afforded to her by a complex array of regulations varies depending on the service that she happens to be watching. Let's say she's watching Absolutely Fabulous with her parents, which is quite a family favourite. Like everything else on TV, that programme must abide by a range of detailed rules covering areas like crime and sex, drugs, language, violence and self-harm. Or she might watch the same episode of Ab Fab on Catch Up or Netflix, where it's still regulated, but to a much more limited set of standards under general European law. For example, there are rules on violence, but nothing on swearing. Patsy is off the leash. And if our typical child picks up her phone to watch a clip of the same show on Facebook or YouTube, there is no regulation at all beyond the general law to protect her from harmful content. So the broadcasting and online worlds are competing under different conditions, even as the online world takes up an ever greater share of our time. This has profound consequences for viewers, especially for children, who may well not distinguish between the two. Without even knowing it, Viewers are watching the same content, governed by different regulation, in different places, or by no rules at all. This is a standards lottery. If protection matters, and we all believe it does, this can't be our message to viewers. Choose your screen and take your chances. Now, there are welcome signs that the technology giants are increasingly alive to their responsibilities. Facebook and YouTube are, between them, hiring 30,000 moderators this year alone. But trust in them is weakening. Our research shows that people see social platforms as the biggest source of online harm, and most people want the rules to be tighter. The role of regulators is evolving too. New European laws will give national regulators oversight of video sharing platforms, requiring companies like YouTube to address child harm, terrorism and hate speech. But most online content will remain unregulated, including words and images on social media and videos that aren't shared on social platforms. The UK government is already considering how to level that playing field, and the DCMS Select Committee has suggested that broadcasting standards set by Parliament, regulated by Ofcom, should provide the basis for setting standards online. 
So what are the lessons from broadcast regulation? Our experience and our research suggests that the answer is not simply to transplant traditional broadcast regulation unamended into the online corpus. Clearly, the internet is different from television and radio in its nature, audience and scale. The sheer volume of text, audio and video is, that is generated or shared online far outstrips the output of traditional media. That means, for example, that it could be impractical to review platforms' decisions about content case by case. Another big difference is that partly because of its volume, most online content is moderated after it is published. There are no producers or compliance teams checking it beforehand. So sanctioning platforms for every undesirable post that it gets uh, might not be practical or effective. Looking more widely, evidence suggests that people see the internet quite differently to television. On TV, viewers value impartiality in news and want to see that guaranteed. But when they go online, they are content to pick from a wealth of different views, often one-sided, often opinionated. And on an individual level, the internet is an unrivaled tool for people to express their views. If regulation is too blunt, it could undermine freedom of expression. Can these hurdles be overcome? Well, based on our experience, we believe they can. Of course, the internet is different, but just as in broadcasting, its audience has fundamental rights, values, and expectations. In seeking to protect audiences, our experience of media regulation suggests that four broad lessons could be relevant. First, Current broadcasting regulation started with a clear set of aims. It works well because the industry is held to high standards by a clearly articulated set of rules that evolves with public opinion. These rules are rooted in Parliament's aims, but they can still develop to reflect the audience's changing behaviour, expectations and attitude. It was interesting to hear the Information Commissioner Elizabeth Denham at the House of Commons Select Committee last week. We share her view that flexible regulation based on broad principles set by Parliament has worked well, both in broadcasting standards but also in data uh, protection. Just as TV regulation has had to evolve in the age of digital and on-demand channels, Internet regulation can recognise the pace of change online. For example, it could grant space for companies to innovate and find ways to protect their users. Second, far from undermining freedom of expression, effective regulation can promote it. Parliament has shown the way by requiring regulation to balance strong audience protections with the broadcaster's right to transmit ideas and people's rights to hear and view a variety of opinions. Third, how to deal with the volume of unmoderated online content. One approach that has worked well in our arena is to regulate companies' complaints processes, as we do with telecoms firms. Companies are not penalised for the harm itself, but for their failure to address it quickly and effectively. As in Germany, as Damien has just mentioned, this could mean requiring tech giants to be much more transparent about how they tackle online harm. The sun that could shine brighter even on Silicon Valley. Likewise, people expect regulators to be equally transparent about the reasons and evidence for their decisions and to impose meaningful sanctions for poor behaviour. Finally, independence of regulation matters. In broadcasting, regulation has been absolutely, uh, independence rather, has been absolutely fundamental to 
to the regulator working in the interest of audiences free from commercial or from political influence. It helps ensure credibility of the system and builds public trust. Crucially, Ofcom is accountable to Parliament. As a regulator, we are required to keep audiences safe and protective, irrespective of the screen they watch or the device they hold. And the lessons from broadcasting regulation could help inform the debate about future regulation. But on the question of exactly how regulation might be applied and by whom, we are entirely agnostic. Those are rightly matters for the government and for Parliament to decide. So I hope the paper today might prove useful to policymakers as they work to curtail the internet's harmful aspects while preserving its powerful benefits to society, culture, trade and freedom of expression. For our part, we will continue to work closely with the government and with our partner bodies, the ICO, the Competition and Markets Authority, the Advertising and Standards Authority in the UK, and with overseas regulators too. Finally, we hope to exchange experiences with you, the lifeblood of our television industry, which for all the pressures imposed by online competition remains the finest in the world. Thank you. Um, well, at this stage, we just have a few minutes. You'll be very well aware of the end of the last session when the, you know, the people were kind of pointing the finger and saying, well, you know, Ofcom can do it. I know you're not interested in making a land grab, but it seems that it, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. We're going to hear from the Secretary of State. We understand that the white paper might have been the autumn, might be the winter, might even be the spring. Um, but this is a territory in which you have expertise. If the government charged Ofcom with doing uh, a job on the internet, is this something that you would be uh, up for doing? So we're not seeking any new, any new powers or responsibilities. Plenty. We've got a quite a big job as it is. I think what we're trying to do today is that there is some experience yes. from the broadcasting world. It's not exact, but there are some principles that we think could be relevant. Um, the matter of Institutional well, arrangements is clearly for, for the government of and course. Parliament and, to and, and actually, as a, an article in The Telegraph said the other day, how can the same regulator be in charge of the price of first-class stamps, driving broadband infrastructure investment and the quantity of religious programmes in Radio 3? It makes it very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk um, about what Damien said about the German model. That's something that clearly you've looked into and that you think would work. And presumably, as in the previous session, you've got very little sympathy with the tech giants about their ability to police themselves. I think what's really interesting, so we do a lot of research with, um, with audiences and with the public because we're concerned about media literacy. And what they say is that they're concerned about consistency, uniformity and transparency. So although, as Damien has said, said, there's a lot, to, there's a lot that the, the tech giants have, have started to do, particularly in the last year, that's not reflected in growing confidence of the no, public. And that, in fact, the trust audiences. has gone down. And trust has gone down. Um, and I think that's why Germany is a really interesting example, partly because it shows that something practically can be put in place. Um, what's also very interesting is that they're focused on transparency and transparency of the process. So when a tech giant says that they're taking down a certain amount of content with a certain amount of speed, are they doing so? And there are effective sanctions if well, they're not. I would just say, again, and this is not, not throwing it off comment, it would be throwing it any regulator, is either the expertise or the volume of people who actually understand how to do that stuff and actually police the internet there. Um, what I would say is that, you know, we're all, as the market changes in, in, in all sorts of new ways, I think we're all developing uh, that expertise. I think for Ofcom, one of the interesting issues for us is that you know our core job is to protect audiences and ensure that we've all got great programming to, to watch. We have seen such a dramatic shift, particularly amongst young people, uh, that they don't they don't know what a television is. They regard their view mostly through catch up, mostly through YouTube. So I think we are um, deepening our understanding whether we really understand the commercial pulses of the tech companies as opposed to how viewers are shifting their habits in the UK, I think is a, is a very good question. 
And of course, it's not necessarily. And the other point is, it's again, it's about this business of are they, you know, what pla are they platform are the publishers? I thought one of the the uh, ways of putting it uh, in the previous session was very good, talking about them as curators. So they might not, but they uh, is the wild west in the sense that people put up anything unregulated, and it's going to have to be after the fact all the time until there was a different culture. I think yes. I mean, one of the one of the the issues that strikes us comparing the online world to broadcasting yeah. is you know the volume of material but yeah. also it is very very it's very very mixed from stuff that looks quite like a tv program yeah. right the way through to something that's like a private conversation which is why i think we're interested in whether some of our lessons from regulating processes overseeing complaints processes after the event could be helpful as the government considers um, it's, it's next step. But, but the other thing uh, uh, about the fangs, it relates to the business, it relates to prominence, it relates to quotas, it, re it relates to advertising rules as well. It's not just about either fake news or indeed internet harm. And I think this is really important. Um, obviously, the, the global giants, on the one hand, are a great opportunity because we've got so much extraordinary content. On the other hand, I think the, the debate that's happening about the level playing field, I think we, we absolutely recognise. So we're... I think Alex mentioned in, in her session, we're consulting at the moment on, on prominence and we're consulting particularly on whether there might be practical ways to introduce prominence if the government decides to legislate in an online world. Um, we're also supportive of the broadcasters collaborating more closely. Um, some in the audience... Because before, of course, it was regarded that we're not going to go back and to call it kangaroo mm -hmm. one, two, ten. But there was definitely worry about that before, but the landscape's changed so quickly um, and so definitely that you don't have any concerns about uh, the broadcasters collaborating I think over a single portal, like I, a, I not British Netflix, but wherever you want to call I it. I think quite the opposite. I think we're very supportive. I Good. think with the benefit of hindsight, uh, I mean, it was, you know, it was a competition authority that knocked back Kangaroo, the British Netflix yep. from eight years ago. I think with the benefit of hindsight, that was a mistake. And I think we want to signal very strongly that um, the PSBs are stronger together. together. Um, and just changing to what Tony, Bl uh, Tony, uh, Tony Blair, <laughs> dear Lord, Tony Hall uh, was saying... Very close, <laughs> very hard to distinguish between uh, yes. the two. Uh, about the BBC set of ambitions. I mean, there were five ambitions. There was, um, you know, more diversity and more for young people. There was out of London. There was high quality programme. There was reinventing services and so forth. And what he seemed to be essentially saying was that he needs that money from the over 75s to deliver quality. And I know you're not about the money, but you're certainly about the quality. Yeah, very much about the quality. I think that's why, I, personally, I'm very confident about the future of the BBC and the future of British TV, because the quality's, the quality's there. We know from all our audience research, what do they want to see? They want to see British TV reflecting the diversity and breadth of the UK. And that's not where for all the glory of Netflix and uh, the new programme we're seeing, they're directed at global audiences. Two minutes left, quick lights up quickly. Let's take a quick question from the audience. Who's going to put their hand up for Sharon White? Quick question for Sharon. God, this is fantastic. No, no questions <laughs> for Sharon. You're just stupefied. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to ask you to give your best bet. Uh, and this, of course, is a completely amateur answer because, of course, you don't know these things. Um, Timetable for legislation. Just tell us, will we have something in place, do you think, by the end of next year? I think this is very much for the Secretary of State in the next year. Ta-da! <laughs> Sharon White, thank you very thank much you. indeed. And let me hand over to David Lynn, uh, the chair of this conference. Thank you very much.